Welcome to the World Stage Podcast. My name is Cedric de Kooning. I'm a research professor here at NUPI. And our guest today is Dr. Solomon Derso. Solomon is the founding director of Armani Africa and one of the foremost analysts of all things African Union and African peace and security. Welcome, Solomon. Good to be here. Thank you, Cedric. So for the next 30 minutes, we are going to have a conversation about the African Union and its evolving position in a changing global order with a special focus on its role in the G20 and its latest initiatives in support of the peace in Somalia and Sudan. But before we get to the African Union, Solomon, why don't we start with a bit of background about yourself and Omani Africa. Uh, what was the key events and decision points that brought you to, to this role that you currently have as an as a analyst on the African Union? And what was your vision for establishing Omani Africa? Thank you very much, Cedric. Um, various points in my uh, study in particular and also uh, professional development, um, I would say that my own upbringing and where I am from, uh, I'm from Ethiopia and at particular points uh, growing up, uh, we have had a difficult situation, particularly in terms of the peace and security and the national context in Ethiopia. And that later on in time when I was pursuing particularly my postgraduate studies uh, drove me into looking for solutions to dealing with, for example, in our context, uh, conflicts relating to ethnic groups uh, or the kind of legal solutions that we can explore in order to deal with uh, inter-ethnic relation questions and difficulties. Uh, later on, I had, um, during my studies uh, on human rights, to visit uh, Rwanda uh, as part of the study. And that was really a very uh, shocking experience. Uh, and, and that was one moment that I distinctly remember where I was saying, okay, I will study human rights, but also the peace and security dimension of things uh, was very uh, of interest. And... I got to do also uh, uh, internship at the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, so it's a combination of these things. Uh, when I decided to uh, establish Amara Africa, it was actually the observation in Addis that you have the Peace and Security Council invested with enormous mandate that requires a lot of very dynamic ecosystem that supports the effective implementation of that mandate. But that ecosystem uh, in Addis was lacking. Uh, member states uh, have limited capacity um, in terms of staffing at, you know, the, the, uh, in Addis, many of them. Um, and and uh, there is a need for an independent analytical input into dealing with some of the complex and difficult issues on the agenda of the Peace and Security Council. It is really to fill in that vacuum uh, and create and nurture that ecosystem for a more effective implementation of the Peace and Security Council protocol uh, that actually embodies some of the progressive uh, multilateral principles and norms. That is really the background behind the establishment of Amani Africa. And the vision is really to uh, provide uh, analysis and information uh, that would enable uh, policymakers to make informed decision uh, and thereby uphold the commitments that states have made under the PSC protocol and other uh, policies of the African Union. Really being that technical partner uh, and provider of analysis um, and indeed provision of capacity support uh, to member states and accompanying them through knowledge production, uh, which is critical component of the contribution for a, mer a more peaceful Africa. No, and I think you, you didn't, Amani Africa is doing an excellent job in pr exactly providing that uh, consistency of knowledge, reminding the member states, because, you know, diplomats come and go, uh, the African Union Commission as a member state body, you know, can't hold member states accountable. 
uh, in terms of previous decisions taken and so on. And so I think uh, it was a fantastic vision and you're doing a, a really important job in providing exactly that kind of backstopping and providing that knowledge ecosystem for the functioning of, of, of the uh, Peace and Security Council. So, so thank you also for that. And let's, uh, let's think then also what, what, uh, what knowledge you can, can help us and guide us in terms of thinking about Africa's role in a changing global order. Because I know Amani Africa, together with Namibia, is also leading a, a high-level panel process to think through Africa's changing Africa's role in a changing global order and the role of the African Union. And I was thinking here yeah, specifically in, in the role of the African Union as now a new member of the G20. Um, so it's in this context that I was wondering, how do you think the AU's G20 membership can benefit Africa, can help Africa to position itself in this changing global order? And, and what are the steps that the African Union needs to take for these potential benefits to materialize? That is really a very important question today, uh, Cedric. Uh, we are in the moment of major uh, shifts happening in global relations and power dynamics. Uh, and in this context, uh, part of that equation is the increasing profile and role of regional organizations. And the African Union is really at the heart of uh, this increasing changing role and profile of regional organizations. It's one of two regional organizations to be a member of the G20. Uh, so it is added to the European Union. Now, in terms of benefits, uh, remember the G20, despite not being a universally, you know, membership uh, platform, the policy debates uh, and directions that it sets ultimately shapes and informs uh, policy decisions relating to global trade, relating to global uh, financial uh, regulations and rules, relating to um, economic, uh, global economic relationships. All right, and Africa has been on the receiving end of this decision-making process. It was not on the table, and that makes a hell lot of a difference when you are on the receiving end of these decision-making processes, uh, you basically do not have any uh, role or agency to shape and inform them, including on some of the things that directly impact you and affect you, uh, such as, for example, if you, today we talk of a major debt crisis uh, affecting increasingly large number of African countries uh, on the continent. And the G20 uh, date uh, comma, uh, framework is one of the parameters and indeed the mechanisms that actually uh, determines how date issues are addressed. Today we are in a moment when there is growing call for changing and reforming this G20 uh, date uh, framework and African Union being on the table uh, would make a hell lot of a difference in terms of actually what the change has to be uh, and what role uh, need, for example, daters have to have. Because much of the decision making uh, is made on the basis of the interests and needs largely of creditors. And the interest of daters is not usually one that makes you know the uh, most important uh, element in, in much of the decision making on debt and debt restructuring uh, and so on. So it is from that perspective that we have to understand and see the importance of actually African Union's membership in the G20, that it enables Africa to exercise influence and agency, uh, both in setting the agenda, then if it influences the setting of agenda in the G20, then it would be able to set an agenda that is adequately, to the extent possible, considerate of the interests and needs of the African continent. That is one side. The other side is influencing the outcome of the decision on that agenda that has been set. Again, with uh, the effective you know, uh, exercise of its agency as a member of the G20, the kind of alignment that it may form with the members of the G20, 
leveraging the membership of the South Africa in the G20 and others, there is a possibility also to make decisions and policy outcomes of the G20 platform more uh, relevant, more equitable, mm. more responsive mm. Mm. to mm. the needs mm. of the African continent. So mm. setting the agenda, influencing how decisions are taken, but that implies a certain level of capacity, knowledge, preparation. Yes. Uh, what steps are the AU taking to prepare for this G20 membership? I think there is um, actually a commendable level of recognition uh, to the fact that uh, it requires indeed uh, a great deal of investment towards building African Union's capacity uh, in order to effectively participate in the G20 processes. We are talking about, for example, uh, 100 plus meetings uh, per year uh, that are you know, in a particular year happening within the framework of the G20. And that requires a lot of capacity, a lot of um, dedicated uh, resources in order to engage meaningfully in those processes. At this point in time, the conversation is one where let's have clarity in terms of African Union's uh, modalities for participation. That one has been sorted out. And the role of here, uh, the permanent representatives committee uh, responsible to the trade, uh, the AU commission, uh, particularly for the Department of Trade and Industry, has been really critical. And they gave uh, enormous amount of attention in order to resolve this one in the course of uh, uh, in February and then now during the course of this uh, mid-year coordination meeting. The next stage is now in terms of harnessing capacity that exists, not, not necessarily within the AU, but outside of the AU including capacity that exists, for example, with the Africa Development Bank, with the UNECA, and within the AU system with AUDANEPAD, with uh, SAFTA. Harnessing that and leveraging that and using it for purpose of, uh, you know, uh, uh, agenda setting in the various work streams of the G20, uh, but also uh, in terms of contributing and preparing policy positions of the African Union all, all, on, on all those relevant uh, areas. At this point in time, those arrangements and infrastructures are being put in place. Uh, we have the assignment of the Sherpa with the African Union Commission, uh, with the Trade and Industry Commissioner being the Sherpa, and then the Sherpa uh, being with the Chair of the Union. Uh, initially, there was a contention around whether it should be with the chair of the union, which rotates annually uh, between member states. But those countries that argued for keeping institutional memory on the part of the African Union, for enhancing capacity for engagement, the, I mean, their view prevailed. And finally, that decision, was, I think, um, wise decision was taken. At this point in time, it's really about identifying what are the priority issues, policy issues, for engagement at the level of the G20 for Africa. Uh, that has been part of the uh, conversation. Date, for example, has been consistently mentioned uh, in the course of the summit, uh, both in, in Addis in February, but also in the course of the mid-year coordination meeting that took place uh, in Accra. Other issues relating to reform of the financial architecture, uh, issues relating to, for example, the channeling of special drawing rights, you know, uh, from the MF uh, and addressing representation questions. And all of that, that would need addressing tax is another issue, which is also critical uh, for, for, for Africa. So priorities in terms of policy agenda and priorities in terms of where the AU at this point in time best actually invests its capacity its limited capacity uh, at, at this point in time. And indeed, I think for this year and next year, it would be a time to understand uh, and then make the necessary adjustments. I would imagine that we need to have actually a wider uh, engagement that leverages the role and contribution of experts outside of the African Union, uh, outside of member states as well, uh, the role of civil society actors who are actually following the work of um, uh, uh, policy issues relevant to the G20, that becomes also very important. But you are right, 
these are the kinds of investment that we need to put into in order to deliver effective and meaningful participation of the African Union for it to lead to those kinds of uh, benefits. Without that, it would be difficult. But, you know, I think if there is goodwill to collaborate and cooperate and support the African Union on the part of member states, South Africa being there, I think there is a possibility for indeed uh, being able to uh, uh, slowly but surely building this uh, capacity that is required. Uh, but it's not an easy thing to do. No, and it'll probably take a few years to, to learn, to, to shape to exactly. what exactly is the ecosystem you need and to adapt to ongoing policy issues. But, but fascinating to see the African Union giving more emphasis to this element, macroeconomic, trade, investment, uh, to the scale that you would require for the G20. The other end of the, of the balance sheet, of course, is, is more on the peace and security side, where Armani Africa has also spe had, a, had a great specialization. So I thought it would be interesting to also get your input on, on Somalia, on Sudan, on some of the burning conflicts that the African Union is also dealing with. Um, I mean, on Sudan, the AU, I would say, has struggled to get an effective process underway to bring an end to the war between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces. But to be fair, no one else has been able to do that either. Although it was, uh, you know, if we look at the general trend, uh, the last couple of years, the African Union, I think, has really stepped up and filled the space when it came to conflicts. But in this particular case, uh, the United States, Saudi Arabia, uh, I would say played a more visual and uh, role, although the Jeddah process wasn't effective up to now, but at least uh, that initiative of, of trying to create a space was, was something which I think many observers felt the AU should have taken that kind of role. Um, what is the status of the AU-Sudan initiatives at this point, and, and what do you think the AU should do differently to, to really try to bring an end to this conflict? So, um, with respect to Sudan, as you know, uh, if there is one conflict, uh, one country, uh, in, res in response to whose conflict situation the AU invested the most, it is Sudan. Uh, the largest number of meetings of the Peace and Security Council uh, some of the uh, AU's uh, tools uh, have been initiated and, ex and, and, and actually tried in Sudan. The high-level panel becoming a model for mediation was first initiated and implemented in, uh, in Sudan. The first AU peace support operation, as you may recall, was also deployed under the authorization of the PSC uh, to Sudan, EMIS, uh, in 2004. Of course, there was AMIB, but before the PSC comes into operation. So Sudan means a lot uh, from that, if you look at it from that perspective as well. So the kind of setback that we have experienced in Sudan, in that sense, is also a blow to the amount of investment that went into stabilizing and resolving uh, and create conditions for um, consolidation of peace, but also the democratization process in Sudan. So there is a lot at stake from the African Union perspective, from African perspective, and also the location of Sudan itself on its own has very serious ramifications. Um, in terms of the response of the um, African Union, uh, as you clear, initially the African Union actually seemed to have taken a lead position within 24 hours, convening of the Peace and Security Council meeting uh, on the 16th of April. Uh, on Easter Day uh, with uh, the chairperson of the commission and uh, more than 10 ambassadors being present in person for that uh, meeting, clearly demonstrating that what the outbreak of war in Sudan was of a major concern for us. I mean, that was, you know, signal. And then the convening of a high-level international ministerial meeting by the EU Commission chairperson on the, uh, on the 20s, with this leading to the establishment of the expanded mechanism. Then, again, another very good initiative. The EU, the Peace and Security Council, outlining the roadmap for the resolution of the conflict. Very important initiative as well. I think where the EU dropped the ball, so to speak, was... 
the establishment of a dedicated mechanism that consistently and, if you like, 24-7 deals with and engages the Sudan file. And initially what happened was basically that the AU Commission chairperson assigned that responsibility to the chief of staff of the AU Commission, who basically is doubling responsibilities, uh, not just as chief of staff, but also working on issues relating to Libya, and then now adding Sudan, which requires actually on its own, separately, a dedicated, a dedicated capacity, not something that you add on uh, and, and come back to when you don't have other things to do. And that, I think, undermined the effective engagement of the African Union. That is why if you look uh, during the time between April and, and, and November, I think that was the time when the AU lost the plot in terms of effective engagement. And the Sudanese on their part, had actually reservation on the assignment of that file to uh, the AU uh, Commission Chief of Staff, who had a baggage of leading some of the engagements of the AU in a previous peace process in Sudan during the transition, uh, in respect of which many Sudanese, particularly Sudanese non-state actors uh, and various Sudanese, had their own you know, uh, concerns, but also uh, serious objection uh, to, 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 to that. And that, I think, didn't really help. Complicating the matter was also the fact that um, there was, you know, leadership contention between the African Union and IGAD. IGAD was also in the scene trying to take leadership with the establishment of its own roadmap. Uh, then you have two roadmaps for the resolution of the same conflict. Uh, then the establishment of a quartet, heads of state uh, government, and IGAD actually couldn't really take this forward. And the result is basically, from the multilateral, regional, and continental perspective, a vacuum emerged. And I think the Saudi-US dimension also is very interesting. Uh, it raises questions about actually... If you look at previous engagement of the U.S. on Sudan file, it has either been through IGAD that led to the, the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the CPA, in 2005, or through the African Union with the AU high-level panel that President Mbeki has been leading. That is how, you know, it has been. All right? This time around, the U.S.'s choice of partner for resolving what is essentially the same uh, country situation was somebody else further away from uh, the continent. And that, I think, raises a very important question about whether or not that was actually really, the, you know, uh, a wise choice uh, in terms of that making and the implication of that. Of course, from one perspective, it is understandable, which is Sudan uh, is of direct interest to the Gulf countries, but the influence of the Gulf countries in shaping the dynamic of the war in Sudan is also outsized. It is enormous. Actually, they are parties, if you like, to the conflict in Sudan. And this extra-sized presence of these Gulf countries in the conflict in Sudan is one of the weaknesses of the African Union's response because the assumption of the African Union's response is that Sudanese actors are on the driving seat. They are not just a pawns for proxy wars by other countries. Um, and, and that assumption may not necessarily be the case in the context of Sudan. But later on, as you saw, you know, although we lost a lot of time, the Peace and Security Council uh, decided to have a dedicated capacity that deals with this file through the high-level panel that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mohammed Ibn Chambas leads. And that provided, actually, the much-needed you know, point of reference for engagement uh, for Sudanese, but also for other actors. And one thing I think, uh, I don't know if you agree with this, uh, Cedric, we are in a moment in which mediation, unlike other times, uh, couldn't be dealt with by a single actor uh, that would deal with all the issues in a comprehensive 
peace process as has been happening traditionally. I think we are in a completely different time and it is, I think, maybe required that there is a process that is dedicated to ceasefire and if that process uh, leads to a certain outcome, well and good. It, what we need to require is its connection with the political process, which the African Union through the high-level panel is leading, and then the humanitarian dimension of the conversation that the personal envoy of the Secretary General has been leading. So I think it is about having a shared strategy that reinforces the role of these different tracks uh, and then tying them together at some point in time uh, through that process. Uh, but I think at this point in time, from the role of the African Union, I think uh, providing effective leadership and platform for the political process of Sudanese, um, having effective mediation strategy, uh, as well as mediation process, that is extremely uh, crucial. And the high-level panel needs also to have um, a dedicated uh, infrastructure uh, that continuously and regularly engages the Sudanese actors and adjusts the mediation process as the dynamics on the ground change. This is extremely important. It also needs to work on really, really importantly on issues relating to investigation of atrocity crimes because the, per the perpetuation of these atrocity crimes makes the resolution much more difficult, makes mediation almost impossible. That is extremely important to put a stop on that one. And then humanitarian access uh, is another thing that needs to be supported. And finally, um, I would say that from the African Union perspective, to play and implement the decision of the Peace and Security Council, for example, on identifying the sources and channels uh, of support through weapons and other uh, you know, funding to the warring parties. That is actually continuing to fuel the fire of the war in Sudan. If there is a way of implementing that and contributing to its reduction, if not complete resolution, I think it would contribute meaningfully to, towards uh, reducing the situation. Thank you. Fascinating. We, we could go on just talking about Sudan for a long time. But in, interest, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to, to Somalia, because I think this is a, another context where the AU has, has made a significant contribution over, over more than a decade now, almost a decade and a half. And we've seen... Uh, um, you know, Amisom playing a critical role initially to secure Mogadishu and, and subsequently most of the liberate most of the urban centers. Uh, that role coming to an end uh, in an Atmis taking over in, in 2022. And uh, now another transition looming, uh, Atmis coming to an end at, at the end of this year. And uh, the PSC has just an, uh, approved, uh, authorized a new mission, AU SOM, I assume is how we pronounce that acronym. Um, what is your sense? Why, why, are, why is it still necessary for the African Union to provide this kind of security guarantee in Somalia now almost uh, a decade and a half later since this all started? I think this is a very important question again, and, and, and indeed, um, if you follow the debate in the Peace and Security Council, uh, questions have been asked. Why did we, for example, move from EMISOM to ATMIS? It was with the recognition and assumption and demand that uh, Somali security forces would take responsibility uh, and uh, with the assumption and increasing transfer of responsibility, the mission would complete its you know, responsibilities and then it would come to an end. And Somalis actually say that you know, by two years we will achieve that level of capacity for you know, taking full responsibility for the security of the country. And here we are, two years later, um, with inadequate progress, if at all, having been made, with Al-Shabaab still alive and kicking, uh, and therefore, basically, the assumptions that were made for the end of ATMIS by the end of 2024 couldn't be realized. And, and, and therefore, the question is, do you basically leave this vacuum to be filled in potentially by Al-Shabaab? Or basically, do you find a way of 
uh, you know, continuing to uh, have a security presence on the ground in Somalia in order not to lose the gains that have been achieved. I think this is one side of really the, the equation. And the other side of the equation is basically people asking, why not then extend, you know, at miss? Why have a new mission, right? And legitimately, so very important question that people are raising in this respect. Because there is a sense, I think, that Somalis need to be really seriously asked uh, a, a very, you know, difficult question. One of the conditions for ending the support of the African Union is for Somalis to generate the requisite number of troops uh, by also drawing on not just the training that is provided by various partners, but also by actually bringing into the national infrastructure the various security forces that are in the in the regions. So that is, you know, one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect of it has to do with not just the generation of forces, but also their capacitation, which is also uh, equally important for them to take over responsibilities. On this one, the level of progress that have been made uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, and part of the question that some member states in the PAC also raised is what guarantee there is, for example, uh, three years down the, the line that we will be able actually to have, not to have the same kind of debate, the same kind of conversation that we are having today. That is one side of the question. The other side of the question is Somalis are saying we will need only 10 or 11,000 11, uh, troops for uh, awesome. <laughs> The acronym is very interesting. It says awesome, awesome. <laughs> and Al-Shabaab today is estimated uh, to be about 20,000. And it continues to have enormous uh, presence uh, in a uh, large ter territory. It continues to mobilize capacity. Um, and in this condition, what does having 11,000 troops mean? Is one of the questions that people and members of the Peace and Security Council during the consideration of this issue have been asking. Why is that we, if we have going, going to continue to have a presence, why don't we have enough, you know, uh, of the troops that would not only be on the defensive, but also do what they did 2010, 2011, that you made reference to, that shift that happened that actually took, if you like, the fighting to Al-Shabaab rather than basically just be taking that defensive position in, in some parts of Mogadishu, as, as you rightly said, Cedric. And that is the other question that I have. Ultimately, however, is the presence, the continued presence of the African Union in Somalia serving as an excuse for Somali national actors to take responsibility for what is happening in the country, to create the conditions for resolving the problem. I think this is the core of the issue that we have today. And another layer has been added, and this has to do with, of course, the debate around whether or not the current uh, troop contributing countries will be uh, the ones making up this new mission uh, that would uh, be operational as of 1st of January. Let's see if that is going to happen as well. Uh, and, and Somali has been saying, no, we want to have a completely new mission. And countries such as Ethiopia that have been part of the uh, ATMIS and EMISOM, uh, they don't want to have Ethiopia in that mission on account of the current um, dispute that they are having with Ethiopia. They would like to have other countries uh, coming in. And this is creating another uh, geopolitical layer and complexity to what has really literally been a very multilateral based support and engagement uh, for Somalia. And I don't know if this is actually going to be um, a very helpful environment for the effective functioning of what is actually now reduced to a much lower level of you know uh, capacity than has been the case so far 
Um, so this is really the kind of situation that we have with respect to this transition uh, from Atmos to uh, Awesome. Mm. I mean, for me, one issue there is that we we seem to be stuck in a um, conflict resolution theory of change, which is just about dealing with Al Shabaab. It's enemy focused. It's security focused, and and I don't mean just the African Union, but the whole international effort is about building up the Somali security forces with the assumption that they will then be able to, you know, contain or defeat Al Shabaab, but. I mean, what I noticed also is that uh, thanks to the work that Amisom and, and Atmis has done, uh, the Somali federal government and, and state governments have control over all the urban centers. And I would imagine that a, a more efficient strategy could be to focus rather on providing governance, basic services, justice in those urban centers and other parts of the country that is already under the control of the government. Uh, to, in that way, offer a better alternative to Al-Shabaab, as opposed to keeping this uh, theory of change that you know stability will come from from somehow containing or defeating, defeating. Al-Shabaab better. But, but, very, uh, very, very, very true. And, and, and also, you know, the question of ultimately, um, even with you having the military upper hand, um, it you know, an idea or a resistance is not going to be defeated. You need actually a political resolution, ultimately. And what is the plan for that political resolution is also part of the equation. And indeed, you are absolutely right. Uh, throwing weapons at this uh, conflict and crisis will not be the solution. It's only to create the space. But the solution is to be found through rolling legitimate local governance structures that deliver services to the people uh, and thereby creating the space for a more secure environment. I can't Absolute, agree more. Absolutely. And we, we have learned that lesson through through the AMISOM and, and other experiences. So, Very true. So I think uh, this is something that uh, we need to bring into our our advice and, yeah. and, and, and uh, knowledge support to absolutely. the African Union. It's relevant well. also in the Sahel, actually. Yeah, yeah, very instructive. Solomon, thank you so much. Uh, I think we've had a, a wonderful conversation uh, this afternoon. Thank you for visiting NUPI and, and good luck for continuation of your work and the work of Omani Africa. Thank you so much, Cedric. Really wonderful to be with you. And you have been a source of inspiration uh, for a long time. Uh, and that has been extremely helpful uh, for me to imagine and indeed do the kind of work that I am doing now, but also to continue to rely on and count on your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.